the guy over there, that's Jay. And right in the middle there, this is Jason De La Roca. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good morning. So, Jason, welcome to our, our humble little show. Appreciate you taking the time and, and putting up with the um, rescheduling of the strep throat incident. Uh, but, yeah, man, welcome. So, you know, I want to start. You, like me, you've been doing this for a very long time, so we don't need to dive, like, fully into your career as we're doing this. But I always do like to find out, how did you get in the industry at first? Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a long story. I mean, I, I was actually studying uh, accounting and I got an internship doing auditing and I did it one day and I said, I'm never doing that ever again the rest of my life. <laughs> and so, and so I, I went up and sort of knocked on the door of the, you know, it was a big accounting firm that does tax and audit and consulting and whatever. And uh, I went to the consulting partner and said, hey, you know, I'm kind of a, a game geek. I can hack stuff. I, I code stuff on my spare time, even though I'm studying accounting. And it just so happened that I knew how to code in a database language that they just sort of got a big client for and, and um, no one on the team knew it. And so they, they called up the intern managers, like, hey, we're taking Jason for the summer. And so I ended up doing a whole bunch of coding and development work and then switched out of accounting and I mean, so that, that, that was sort of the jump from sort of boring accounting work into actual development and code. And then, and then I totally scammed my way into a job at Silicon Graphics. That, you oh, know, wow. Back, yeah. Going, going back to sort of 20 years, you know, they, they were on the cusp of, uh, you know, multimedia and, and, the, you know, VFX and, you know, they had, they had those mainframes that did all the awesome CGI work for the early movies. And I remember sitting in the office when they brought in an, uh, an N64, which was uh, the Nintendo that was using a, a, a Silicon graphics chip. Um, so I, for the first few years, I was more on the graphics 3D hardware uh, side of things. I, I think that's kind of funny. I hate I hate doing accounting and spreadsheets, but I like code. In my mind, it's all the, <laughs> it's all the freaking same thing, dude. It's all a bunch of numbers and gobbledygook. I'm just not down with any of that stuff. Yeah, well, <laughs> at least you know I mean, your passion. You know. Well, but it, interestingly <laughs> enough, it was it was some it, like way back then, like accounting uh, and technology was basically you were implementing Oracle software, like. Like you were some big ass bank and you're like, we're going to, you know, digify. And then you go in and you install Oracle uh, and then you tell the bank, okay, now this is how you have to do your business because this is the way Oracle works. Uh. And, and there was no, there was no sort of plasticity. Whereas myself being, you know, gamer, hacker, you know, whatever, it's like, well, why don't we just change the code? So it matches the, you know, their workflow and the, no, 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 Oracle works like this. And that's the best way to do it. <laughs> And so, and so I, I got frustrated because I knew that you could change and customize and recode stuff. Uh, and, and yet everyone was too scared to touch the code. And I'm like, well, screw this. I'm, I'm out of here. That was, it was just too frustrating. So it's more, it's more about that kind of plasticity. Uh, and, and, you know, I think, I think game developers feel this way. It's right. Like we, we play with magic. I mean, we, we have code and. If you can imagine it, you can code it, and we can we can literally build anything, uh, and, and you know, and, and so that that was sort of like a an initial wall I hit, you know, when I was really young, many many years ago, more in this kind of accounting business context. Nice. Yeah. I mean, that totally makes sense. That makes sense because then uh, if you were if you are inside of it instead of being outside of it, then you can put all of your energy and whatever into it instead of just saying here's this is what it is you guys have to do this yeah there's wow. one way of doing this and that's it no that's I, it again I, we're going back 20 plus years you know but uh so i have a I, I got a quick question about coding really quick all right because i took some you know i i know a little bit of like css and html which is i know is not coding i learned machine language when i was a kid maybe that's showing my oh. age but yeah. um so when you write code, are you concerned about like how it looks in your eyes? Are you concerned? So many coders are like, I want my code to be beautiful. Is it more important for it to be beautiful or for you to be fast or for it to be efficient or what? Yes. Okay. 
<laughs> like, because I know you can like you will, can look at some people's codes and be like, I know who wrote this. If it's someone that you know and are familiar with, you can go, I know who wrote this just by looking at it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, have, I haven't done any serious coding in, in years and years. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, first and foremost, it's got to work. I mean, so it's about efficiency or effectiveness. You know, that, then you have to start worrying about optimization and speed and so on. Um, and I, I mean, I, I did like the sort of the formatting of it, uh, in part because it allowed me to kind of remember what I did and, and go back through it. I mean, certainly in a team context, uh, I, I mean, you know, commenting your code and making it properly formatted and all this kind of stuff, I mean, it's worth its weight in gold so that other coders can go through and clean it up and understand what, what kind of gobbledygook you writ we wrote and stuff. So it, it's, it's all, it's all important. So now you're on the investment side and you, yeah. you ran execution labs, which you ramp, you ramp down the investment side of that, but you're still maintaining and supporting all those projects, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, execution labs, uh, was started in late 2012. We did our first investments in early 2013. Uh, we had about seven and a half million uh, dollars to, to play with. Uh, it was uh, private money, so we raised funds from other investors and, and strategics. Uh, and we were doing very early stage uh, investing in game studios. Uh, and we were running a kind of incubator accelerator program with that in order to provide mentoring and coaching and such. Uh, and we did 25 deals over the span of, uh, I guess, three years, more or less. Uh, and um, uh, you know, we, we essentially spent the money. I mean, you, you invest and you, you put it in the companies and, and, and you deploy the fund as your investors want you to do. Uh, and so we did 25 investments. And so we're not making new investments now because it's, you know, the, the funds been deployed, uh, but it does mean now that we are shareholders in, uh, in these companies and we have a responsibility to support them and, you know, go to board meetings and, uh, you know, advise and, and, uh, you know, in short, help them to be successful so that the money we invested, you know, actually makes a return. See, I mean, I love my job. I love what I get to do now, but to do that, to that is like my sort of dream job. It's like, <laughs> we have this money. You need to go find us really cool things and help them succeed. I mean, I would be all over that. Yeah. So there's two basic kinds of funding that we're going to look at you know there's the project side and then there's the equity side so yeah. from a basic level you know break that down what's the difference between the two yeah so i i mean it's it, 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 this is sort of like the the most important kind of fork that, that that we need to take when we're thinking about funding and and it stems from first and foremost understanding what opportunity you have in your hands. And so I'm going to take a step back and, and there's a few, there's a few challenges. One is developers who, who have not sort of dealt with funding and fundraising and pitching and all this kind of stuff. Um, they often have two kind of misconceptions. One is that, you know, when they need some money, they're just going to go somewhere and grab one big bag of cash <laughs> and, and like, oh, I need money now. Well, I'll go over to the rainbow and there'll be a leprechaun there with a pot of gold and I'll just grab it when I need it and all my money problems will be solved. So there's this kind of like single source of pot of gold myth. Um, and, and the other one, which is a serious one is they think of funding as a solution to their lack of money problem, right? It's a developer wakes up and is like, oh crap, I, I need some money. I'm, I'm missing money. I need budget. I need funds. I got to pay people. I got a money problem. So I got to go out in the world and see who has one of those big bags of money that I can just grab because I need it because I got this missing money problem. And, and, you're in a lot of trouble if <laughs> that's your mindset when you go out into the world to get funding. Uh, and so first and foremost, 
you cannot think of your fundraising effort as the solution to your missing money problem. You have to think of it more so as an opportunity. Meaning, you know, there are investors out there in the world, different kinds, and we'll get into that, uh, that are looking for opportunities to invest their money in cool things that can bring success in return. And so I need to present myself as a legitimate opportunity. And we'll have to discuss well, what does an opportunity mean, uh, but the fork between company and project or equity and project financing initially forces you to understand whether your opportunity is primarily about the project you have versus the company you're building. And, 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 there's a, and, and like the sources of funding, how you pitch, the, the way you raise all that stuff changes dramatically whether or not you're on one path or, or the other. So then if I, if I'm running my development studio and I need money to get the game that we're working on right now out the door, that's the project side. Uh, and maybe, if, maybe <laughs> it's like every other business question. Is this right? Well, it could be. So, and, so, the, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to oversimplify certain things and it's kind of good for like 99% of the cases. There's always exceptions, whatever, but rule of thumb is if you are working on games uh, that are premium and we'll sort of shortcut that and say it's a game as a product, right? Here's my 20 levels. It's got, you know, 15 hours of gameplay. I'm going to put it on Steam and Xbox and PlayStation for 20 bucks. You know, it's, it's a product, uh, then you want to look for project financing. Publishers being the main source, but there are other sources and we can get into that. But but if I if I if my opportunity is a cool game and it's a premium game and it's that means it's a product, I gotta go for project financing. If on the other hand, I'm working on projects that are more games as a service free to play, uh, you know, online multiplayer match based, uh, you know, Hearthstone, League of Legends, uh, uh, um, Fortnite, uh, Clash of Clans, you know, uh, Clash Royale, etc. Things that in theory are infinitely scalable uh, and have the opportunity for exponential growth. Then I'm more down the path of investing uh, in the company and finding equity investors in in the company. So that that that's that's kind of you know 99% of the time it's if I'm if I'm on the 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 games as a service bandwagon then I'm looking for equity investors in the company. If I'm on the sort of premium more traditional games as product bandwagon, then then I'm mainly looking for investors for each of those products. All right, so let's dive into, you know, a, a little bit of what you just went through. So developers generally know that publishers are where they go for project funding. What are the right. other options that they have? Yeah, so, so um, yeah, I mean, pro project funding, uh, I mean, uh, as you say, uh, um, publishers historically have been the largest source of project funding. Uh, and remain so today. Uh, other sources of project funding include Kickstarter, right? Crowdfunding. These these primarily are. I mean, it's reward based, but uh, you know, the, the, you're pitching the project as this amazing opportunity, and, and you're getting people to to, to back you. Um, you still have uh, you know fr friends and family, right? So you know your uncle that's got a bit of spare cash, and he's like, oh, that that sounds cool. You know, I'll give you a hundred grand. Uh, for 10% of the revenues of the project, you know, uh, good luck. I love you and whatever. So it's still kind of a, a you know, a, I call that a, a love investment, but it's an investment in the project. Um, uh, what else? Uh, yeah. So, so publishers, uh, you know, uh, crowd, crowdfunding, uh, fr friends and family. Uh, hold on a second. There's others. I've got my list here handy. I always forget some. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, depending where you are in the world, you can often apply for different government grants. Uh, yes, so, the CMF. 
Yeah, so Canada has something with the Canadian Fund. I mean, in, in Finland, you have uh, Business Finland that has uh, R&D funds. Uh, you know, Malaysia has different funds. I mean, uh, there, there are certain regions that do have governmental uh, support programs. Those tend to be uh, project-oriented uh, funds. Uh, another source is what I would call platforms. Right. So uh, as an example, when Sony was preparing the launch for PSVR, you know, they were looking for VR optimized content to showcase on on Sony, on PlayStation. And so they were, you know, providing a, a decent amount of project uh, production funding to to bring games to their to their platform. Um, so that that, you know, if you're at the right place at the right time with the right kind of content and you have a new piece of hardware or a new new platform that's coming and they're eager to bring content to the platform, um, you know, that that is a, that is potentially a good good source of, of project or, or production funding. Um, you have also uh, alpha or early access sales, uh, which is sometimes developers. Will, I mean, I, I think Minecraft is like the best example of, of alpha pre-sales essentially funding the growth and development of that project. Or, or you, you know, we do from time to time hear about successful examples of of, um, uh, of early access games like Rust or Day One uh, or H1Z1 that make you know millions of dollars in early access as, as a way to fund uh, fund production. Doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. When I mean, you have you have uh, festivals and contest prizes that sometimes also can provide uh, some funding. I mean, that one is highly variable and usually not big amounts, you know, five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand. I mean, if you win the IGF at GDC, I think the grand prize is 25,000. Uh, there's a, the Brazil Indie Game Festival. They have, I think their grand prize is 10 or 15,000. You know, so I think I think that's a nice to have. And certainly if you're a small yeah. indie team, you know, winning a, an extra 10 grand, is probably uh, super appreciated. But like, I, I wouldn't plan my budget. <laughs> on traveling the world winning we're gonna get halfway through alpha and then win the igf that's the yeah. um, that's the budget yeah, plan yeah. yeah exactly um and then and then the other one uh and, and i guess the other sort of really common source is is yourself yourself slash your day job slash uh you know a work for hire contract that's coming in slash the revenue of the previous project you know whatever you're able to put on the table you know, normally that's the first source of funds, uh, even if it's not an actual like I'm writing a check to myself to invest. It's more just I've got savings in the bank and so I can work on this, you know, as I as I you know pay my rent from my savings or or my day job or whatever. Um, so that, that's the yeah. It's, so it's a, yeah, it's certainly expanded over you know, the last 20 years, I mean, we've seen Kickstarter get really big and now Kickstarter is really rough to try to raise money on because it's just, it's, you, well, you have to come in with your own social group and, and your own following or yeah, you yeah. Stand, stand to not get a, a traction at all. Yeah. So, so, uh, I mean, Kickstarter still does generate, you know, several millions of dollars of revenue for game projects. I mean, it's still, it's still a viable tool. Uh, but as you say, you need to come to it with your community. Uh, and, and you have to sort of mobilize your existing fan base. And, and they come surging into Kickstarter to help you succeed. And so, uh, you know, going back five years, you know, in Kickstarter history... I mean, you were able to kind of come and I've got a cool concept and here's a rough prototype and, and it's announced and it's a novelty and everyone comes and whatever. Uh, but, but every year, the sort of it's shifted later and later, whereas now you have to come to Kickstarter, not really to start the project, but more like to finish the project. It, yeah. and, and, um, and, the, and using Kickstarter as a tool to kind of uh, well to kickstart your community as well is is like that's absolutely dead. You, you have to have your community, and so the the mistake is uh, developers are still often thinking about Kickstarter as it existed five years ago and not sort of the modern uh, situation. And you know they know they have to spend a month making a nice video and putting together the nice prize packages, and then they know the month of the campaign they're going to be super busy answering questions and 
hustling, but they forget that they should have done six to nine months of community development work leading up to the launch. And, and, and that's where they're just dead on arrival um, and, and where you have uh, failed projects. Uh, wh whereas if you actually did that, sort of you planned literally a year in advance, th then your chance of success goes up dramatically. So uh, we got a question. What do you think about fig? Yeah, fi fig's a different animal. I mean, fig is uh, one of the sort of the, the, the new fancy uh, equity-based uh, uh, crowdfunding platforms, um, where where it's not just rewards-based funding, but there is an option for the backers to actually take a slice of the game, right? A, a rev share. Um, and this is, you know, following the new, I guess it's called the Jobs Act uh, that was approved a few years back that allow you to use crowdfunding platforms to uh, give out actual stake, a stake in your, your project or, or company. Um, so, so it's a lot more, call it serious, uh, and you are taking on investors in the project that you will owe a share of the revenues back to. Um, uh, you, you know, so it's, 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 it's a different kind of tool, even though it's using similar crowd sourcing uh, principles. Um, uh, but, but, but Fig also has been quite uh, curated. I mean, you know, it's they extremely do, curated. Yeah, yes. they do. They do. They do very few projects uh, it, it, because I, I, I think I mean, they have to be because not everything is sort of suitable to take on investors in that way. Uh, and so they, they've been quite um, uh, you know, careful about about curating which projects come on, and um, I, I mean, I've not followed Fig so closely. Uh, it, it certainly seems that the ones that do well or, or the ones they let on tend to be the ones that are, you know, from from In Exile and Tim Schafer, the high profile ones to begin with. Um, yeah, so. it could be. I mean, I don't know the interior workings of, of what you know Tim and Brian and those guys are doing over there either, but it seems to me that they know before they launch something that they're going to get a substantial amount of the investment and it's not going to fail. I think there's a whole lot of research and a whole lot yeah. of curation that goes into all of those things that, that FIG does. So if you get in and they say they're going to do it, then you got a pretty good chance of getting funded. It's Yeah, that, that, that it, seems to be the case. I mean, you know, I think, uh, I, again, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but certainly it felt like their success ratio was extremely high, but, you know, they only do 10 projects. Yeah. You, you know, whereas Kickstarter is, you know, you got 300 plus projects or whatever the number is, um, you, you know, every year. Uh, and, and the success ratio, I think, is hovering in that kind of, you know, one out of every five or one out of every six kind of kind of range. But, but off. Yeah, something like that. All right, so we have we've talked several times about what publishers want to see, and you know, if someone's got questions, we can we can dive into that. But that's a topic that we've covered multiple times already. What mm. do investors want to see when you're going in for equity funding? Yeah. What is it that those investors are looking for? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so we covered project funding sources. Uh, as you say, of which publishers are one of the prime ones uh, on the company side, or equi you know, on the equity side, the the, the sources are are, are quite uh, quite different. Well, there's, there's, well, I guess not that different, but there are different ones. Um, so so before I answer your question about what they're looking for, let's just quickly cover kind of the sources. The that works. Uh, so so similar to project funding on the company side, the first investor is usually you. You or your co-founders, uh, and that could be, you know, you're putting in a bit of your savings into the company to get the company up and running, uh, or, or it also could mean sort of sweat equity, meaning you're just not paying yourself. And so you're investing your, you know, blood, sweat and tears and your energy and, and knowledge and expertise. But, but generally you and your co-founders are the first quote unquote investors into your, into your studio, into your company. Uh, next after that, you would have a similar kind of friends and family. Uh, where where now the uncle, you know, is not giving you money for revenue share on the project, but the uncle is saying, "Hey, I like the vision you have for this company. You know, that may be a, an investor in my company." Um, so friends and family. 
Uh, you do have uh, some accelerators or incubators that do provide funding. So Execution Labs is an example uh, of, of that kind of uh, uh, investor that was packaged as an accelerator type entity. Um, there are tons of these all over the world. The issue is that not many of them touch game companies uh, because they just don't have the expertise or knowledge um, and, and, and they don't have the right mentors or, or networks and stuff. So, um, you know, if you if you live in a town where there is an incubator accelerator and, and they're like saying, yeah, come join, uh, I, I mean, be very careful that uh, you're not just taking a little bit of money, giving up some of your company, and, and then they're not really able to help you because they don't have any of those networks or, or mentors and stuff. Because there is a lot more to getting investors than just the money. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we could talk about that uh, after. Um, so equity crowdfunding is like FIG, which we just talked about before, uh, is, is another source. I mean, equity crowdfunding is not legal in every country. So depending where you are in the world, that may or may not be a tool for you. I mean, I'm pretty sure, I mean, Canada, I think it's legal mostly and UK and Sweden and Finland and a few other places, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. You have to do a little bit of research to see, to see what's uh, possible from where you're from. Uh, then you have angel investors. Uh, and angel investors, importantly, are individuals that are investing their own money. You could also call these uh, business angels, uh, but 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 usually it's someone who you know made it rich from selling their own company or their I don't know they've got oil money in the family or who who knows what they're just rich uh, and they're they're playing around and having fun by investing in cool startups uh, and importantly uh, because it is their own money and they're investing as individuals it, there is a bit more of a kind of an emotional uh, aspect to their decision making. It's not purely financial. They are thinking about, you know, who, which founders do I like, which industries do I think are cool and interesting, uh, you know, this, this kind of stuff. It's more fun to invest in a game company than it is a company doing banking software or, you know, whatever. Uh, but, but they're investing their own money. Uh, then you would have uh, venture capitalists or VCs, uh, which tends to be the only thing that people think about when they think about equity funding is, you know, the famous Silicon Valley VCs. Importantly, VCs are professional investors. Uh, it is their job to manage a fund of, uh, uh, that they raise from other investors, from larger investors. Uh, and so they're, they're in making investment decisions on behalf of those other higher, higher level investors. So they're, unlike angels who are you know, investing their own money, VCs are professional investors investing other people's money. Uh, and then the last category would be what I call strategic investors, or um, you, I mean, you also call this kind of corporate funds. So some uh, large companies will also manage internal funds where they can do uh, venture investing or early stage investing in companies that have strategic value to their business. And so the classic example I would give is Intel. So Intel has a corporate sort of strategic fund and internal fund. Uh, and uh, an example would be they, they do an investment in some company that's doing quantum computing research. I mean, I don't know if they have, it's just, an, it's just for illustration purposes, but you can imagine that, you know, Intel getting in early on smart people doing quantum computing chips uh, is strategic to their business as a chip manufacturer. Uh, and so, in that context, it's less about, you know, we're going to make a lot of money. Here's a good business deal. It's more they're, they're weighting the strategic value of getting in early in a quantum computing chip company. Again, just as an example uh, for, for illustrative purposes. So you do, you do have these kind of more strategic investors uh, out there. And so uh, more, more directly, uh, you know, Tencent uh, does have what they call their gameplay innovation fund. Uh, and so they're an example of a, of a corporate fund or a strategic investor uh, that is out there in the world making early stage investments uh, in game companies that are doing particularly innovative gameplay as they see that as being of strategic value to their, to their business. So those, those are the sources. 
And your question was what? Your question was what do investors look for? Yeah. What are, what are they what are they looking for in the company? What kind of materials do you need to be, you know, yeah. have well, ready for them? That sort of stuff. Yeah. So so uh, I, I mean, it, it, it goes back to opportunity mindset. Right. So, so I, I remember with execution labs, we, we would get meetings. We, we, were, we were quite open. We, we, you know, if you emailed us, we take a call, we, we would take a meeting if you're in town or at a show, you know, we, we were very developer friendly. And so we would often have a developer come in and they would say, Hey, you know, I'm developer X. I've got a cool project with ninjas and uh, we're, we're behind schedule. Uh, you know, our, our programmer needed to get paid, so 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 he left. Uh, we're, we we want to go to PAX, but we have no money. Uh, we booked a booth, but we don't have any any budget to sort of go there. Uh, we've done no community development because all our all our focus has been on programming the game. Uh, so we you know we need some marketing money. Um, we're about six months behind schedule because we lost our coder. Are you interested? That totally does not sound like a company I would want to invest in <laughs> at all. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I, I'm not even making it up. Like, 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 more than half of the pitches we got was some variation of that. Oh, I believe you. Well, I get well, people calling me, you know, all the time. Going back to my days when I was an agent, they're like, "We need to find a publisher because we're not going to make payroll next week." Yeah, what they need yeah, to do is take out a loan and find somebody to uh, manage their business. <laughs> so, so I, I, I mean, hey, making games is hard. You know, building a successful studio is hard. Uh, you know, game developers often are in this kind of problem-solving mindset. And so they're listing out, here's all the problems. I got no budget for packs. I lost my coder. I didn't do marketing. We're behind. You, you know, help me solve these problems I have. Uh, and, and, and no investor, I mean, unless, unless you're pitching to your mom that says, oh, poor, poor honey. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll give you some of my you know, money, whatever. Um, no, no investor is interested in that. Right. And so, so the first thing you need to do is kind of, you know, flip it from a problem solving mindset to a, I have an opportunity mindset. And even if there is some problems underneath, it's still, I have a real opportunity because ninjas are hot now and my game is going to be awesome. It's going to be the next this and it's going to, and, I, and I've done my, my research uh, in terms of the competitive landscape and, and uh, you know, and there's some big ninja movies that are coming out. So I know the trend I'm trending and I, I don't know, like, like you have to present it as this amazing opportunity. And so first and for, foremost, uh, you know, investors are interested in opportunities. Now, an opportunity can mean a lot of different things, right? The example I gave of a strategic investor, you know, Intel was interested in or is interested in quantum computing research. And so their opportunity is not necessarily a financial result. It's more about getting in on quantum computing because that may be the, you know, the shift that occurs in the next uh, decade or whatever. Um, whereas an angel investor, they want an opportunity to make a little bit of money, but also to work with some cool people and, you, you know, uh, you work on an interesting project. Uh, so, so you have to think about, you know, who, who you're pitching to and, and what does an opportunity look like to them. But generally speaking, uh, when you're pitching to equity level investors, they're looking at the founders, right? So you and your co-founders, who are you? What's your attitude? What's your background? What have you done before? Uh, you know, how are you approaching the business? You know, do you have tenacity and perseverance? Uh, you know, what kind of network and connections do you have? Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, because they're, they're really betting on you as the co-founders. Uh, and as a side note, importantly, I say co-founders plural, because it's very rare that investors will back a solo entrepreneur again unless it's your mom or, or your uncle uh but 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 almost almost all investors uh want to see that there is a team of co-founders leading the company so for example execution labs we only invested uh if there was a minimum of three three co-founders and those three co-founders had to have complementary skills there had to be a technical leader a creative leader and a sort of a business management leader and if those three co-founders and leaders were not present, then then 
doesn't matter how cool your game was or how much I love ninjas or whatever, we would not do that deal because we, we needed th those founders in, in place. So, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that investors look at with respect to the co-founding team. So that's one piece of, of the puzzle. The other piece or another piece is uh, the vision of the business, right? So, so you know, what, 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 what's your plan? What's the roadmap? What direction is this company going into? Uh, what kinds of games are you making? What audience are you going after? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I sort of encapsulate that into the vision. What's the vision of the studio? And so one of the mistakes that many studios have is they have no vision, right? It's one of us wants to do a VR racing game today. Okay, well, let's go do a VR racing game. And then that didn't work. And now I want to go make a ninja game on console that, you know, is like, whatever, Ninja Gaiden or something. Okay, well, that sounds cool. Let's go do that. And so the tools, the technology, the expertise, the reputation, whatever fans we made with the VR racing game are almost completely irrelevant to the Ninja console game that we're going to make next. And if that doesn't work out and then we're going to go do an AR game, Pokemon, I mean, whatever, it, like it's so random that we don't really build any, any scaffolding uh, any reputation, any momentum down a certain path. And so this idea of a roadmap, of a vision, of a direction uh, is, is super valuable and investors are looking for that. Uh, as an example, one of the trick questions that we would have when developers would come pitch to us would be, all right, Jay, I like your ninja game idea, cool. What does your third game look like? And if you weren't able to answer that meant we knew you were really only focused on the current ninja game. You weren't thinking, okay, well, the ninja game is a single player this, then the next one is the sequel where we'll add multiplayer, and the third one we're going to go cross-platform with, you know, whatever. And, and so each, each one is a sort of a building block to the next, and our, our fans of ninjas will come from one game to the next. Like, like that's the kind of answer we want to see, that you have this roadmap and vision, where if you're like, oh, crap, I have no idea. I'm so focused on just making this thing right now, it, it was, it was a, a kind of a big indicator that you were project focused and not sort of vision, I'm building a business, I'm building a company for the long term kind of, kind of mindset. Um, so that, so that's, that is a big piece of what investors are looking at is this kind of vision and roadmap. Uh, and, then, and, then the, and then the other piece is, okay, well, what, what are you actually building now? Like what, what do you've got, in, what, what do you've got cooking? And does and that make sense relative to this vision? Is that the first step on, that, on the journey for that vision? Do we believe that this first project gets you to the next one? You know, will, the first, will this project you know, be relevant to building that vision, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and so, so it's kind of weird because developers often are so project-oriented, like this is what I'm working on right now, whereas investors... Our, our equity level investors tend to look at the project, uh, you know, kind of in third or fourth place. You know, they're, they're much more interested in these longer term, bigger picture uh, aspects. That's interesting. I, I didn't realize that investors wanted that. I mean, it makes sense to me from the business side of it that you want a variety of co-founders in there. And of course, somebody that has business experience but I didn't realize that it was that hard, that much harder to get investment as a single or maybe two people type thing. Yeah, I mean, it's not impossible. It's certainly harder. And and I mean, if you're two, it's easier. But but if you're one person, I, I mean, okay, listen. If if you're the lead designer of Fortnite and you leave to start your new studio, I mean, everyone's gonna throw money at you. They don't <laughs> you're gonna get money. <laughs> They don't, they don't care if you have a partner or not. It's like, please take my millions. So, so I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule, but all things be equal. If you're just another person making another game, building another studio with none of these kind of unfair, exceptional aspects, uh, uh, proper equity level investors will be very hesitant to back a solo founder. Um, and, and, uh, I mean, it's true, especially true in games. It's true in business in general. There's just a crap ton to do to build a successful business 
you, you can't do it alone. It's super, super hard. Uh, and then when you factor the additional complexities of game development, uh, I mean, you, you, you just, you just need the extra bodies to, to carry the weight. Um, and I, I mean, particularly at the startup phases, you also want this kind of, you know, triad of people, right? Creative, technical business to be able to fight with each other and argue with each other on an equal footing. And, and in our early days, we made some investment, you know, uh, mistakes where we didn't have that rule in place yet, uh, where, where the, the, the founding team was unbalanced. And so, you know, I'll just give you an example. Uh, imagine uh, you and I are starting a studio and we're both artists, you know, we're creative geniuses. We make things beautiful and, you know, we're just whatever, creative, super creative. And so we have the great idea of starting our own business and we hire some programmers and some, you know, whatever musicians and whoever producers, whatever. And we've got this grand vision and it's something beautiful. And we sketch it all super nice and whatever. It's all awesome. And the programmer comes to us and says, Hey boss, you know, J and J sorry, man, like this, this stuff is beautiful, but like, I can't code it. You know, it's going to take me 10 more months than we have budget for whatever. And then we say to the coder, you know, shut up, stop being lazy. It's code. You can do anything, you know, make it work, make it work. We're, we, you know, it's so beautiful. And then, and then the programmer comes back to the, sorry, man, I just can't, okay, you're fired. Right. And so, and so because that programmer is just a minion, they're just an employee. They can't sort of fight with us and say, listen, guys, like this is not working. I'm a co-founder. I own, I own a third of the company, just like you. I'm putting my foot down. And as the technical leader, this cannot be done or, or it can't be done in a time frame that we have budget for, you know, whatever. And then, and then as co-founders we're like, okay, fine, Andy, you know, okay, we got to listen to you. Uh, you know, we'll compromise. Um, and so, and so if you don't have sort of the, the creative technical and business co-founders able to sort of fight with each other at that equal footing, uh, that then, then the, the, the project, the company can kind of veer off in, in very dangerous ways that, uh, uh, is hard to recover from. And they have to be willing to argue too, because too often you see, and, and not typecasting here, but quite often it's the creative voice who are more apt to not, you know, jump up and put their foot down and say, you know, we can't design this blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't matter which aspect of it is. You have to be willing to stand up for your tent pole. You're part of that tent or yeah, exactly. it's not going to, it's not going to matter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I've got my triumvirate. I've got my game I want to make. I've got my my vision for the future. I know I need equity investment. Where the hell do I start? Where yeah. you know? How do I go and and find these things? Is there is is there a Google listing of it somewhere <laughs> or? No. no. So so um, yeah. I mean the the timing matters. And and. If you're doing equity level investing or, or, or fundraising, generally the source of funding will depend on the stage you are at as a company, uh, meaning how much revenue are you generating or, or you know, are, are you profitable? Uh, and, and, you know, that, that could be a timeline of a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a couple of years. It really depends. But generally speaking, the first investor in your company is you. Or you, you and your co-founders, right? So you each put five grand on the table. You buy some computers. You rent an office, whatever. You register the company. You hire a lawyer. Uh, and Which and you, you don't need to hire a lawyer, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah, hire a lawyer, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, always, always. Um, again, I mean, this is like if you're starting a business and seeking investors, th this is you know for real now. This is no longer your hobby and pastime. This is we're doing it for real. And if you're doing it for real, you need a lawyer to make sure you don't do anything dumb uh, or, or, you know, and end up in problems and whatever. So, yeah, absolutely. Lawyer, accountant, all that. This is like the real world now. Um, so, so at the very beginning, it's you, your co-founders, you're investing maybe some cash, but also investing your time, your sweat equity, as we mentioned before. Uh, and, and 
This is critical because no one else will invest until you've made that commitment yourselves. And so I, I see it, and I, Jay, I don't know if you've seen this as well, where you have employees at the big studios and they're tired of working on you know, FIFA 29 and Assassin's Creed 17 and God of War 12 and you know whatever. And they're like, well, I'm just waiting. Once a VC gives me my $5 million, you know, I'll quit my job and get started on this cool ninja idea that I had. Yep. And, and I hear it all the time. And it's like, buddy, if you are not willing to make the investment in yourself and take that risk in yourself, nobody, nobody is doing that. Again, maybe if you're the Fortnite designer, maybe you can get away with it. But, uh, but in general, you are your first investor. So, so, you know, don't, don't be waiting around. Don't be holding on to your, you know, your, your full-time job and hoping that someone's going to get like, it's not going to happen. You, you, you and your founders are your, your first investors. I, so look, then, I, I call it the, the Cortez rule. When Cortez got to the oh, new world, he burnt burnt. the boats and said, we ain't going back. And, and that's what you, you have to be willing to do that. You know, you have yeah. to be willing to make that step because you're right. Nobody else is going to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in fact, yeah, that's a good metaphor. I mean, in, in, investors are looking for the burnt boats. They're like, you know, is this team, are they in it? Do they commit? Do they put skin in the games? They burnt the boats. There's no going back. Like, okay, I'm, I'm on a backless team because they're, they're in it to win it kind of thing. So, so once you've done that, then the next source is the friends and family. Right now, now you, you've got the company up and running. You put it together. You've got your vision. You're starting to work on stuff. And then you're like, crap, you know, no, no one believes in us. Only someone who loves us is willing to back us. Now that could be, you know, it could be your spouse. It could be your mom. It could be your uncle that has a bit of spare money. It could be your doctor buddy that's rich that lives down the street. It could be your, you know, your, your friend from high school that's running some random tech company that like, who knows, right? Who knows? Friends and family, you go to them. And these are, these are small amounts. This is 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand. Uh, and, and the point is that the company is so early. It's such a risky investment that only someone who loves you would be willing or sort of foolish enough to invest in a company at that early stage or that risky of a stage. So the kind of friends and family round. Of friends and family. Now you've taken your money and sweat. You've taken some money from your uncle and your doctor buddy down the street. You're starting to make progress. You got your prototype going, you're refining the vision, you know, things are falling into place. Then you can go talk to angel investors. Now the challenge is the angel investors are not listed anywhere. Uh, there's no directory. There's no hangout for them. Uh, I mean, some cities may have an angel network that that run like monthly meetups and stuff, but normally those are for like investing in pizza shops and you know dry cleaners and stuff, not not sort of tech companies. So angels are difficult in that you really have to hustle, you have to dig, you have to network, you have to go to startup events and pitch events and you know go to industry. Like you like you really have to dig and scrounge to find people that are kind of in the shadows investing in, in games. Um, and generally you have more success trying to find people that have had their own success in the game industry before. So if you're in a town where a studio just got bought by Zynga or got bought by Microsoft or someone sold their tech to Google and, you know, those are the ones to go see first because angels tend to invest in the sectors that they were themselves successful in. And they assume that they have confidence that they know how the industry works or they have the right connections or they know the secret sauce. So, you know, if, if I, if I was, if I was successful in biotech, I'm probably going to invest in biotech companies. If I was successful in clean energy company, I'll invest in clean energy startups. If I, if I sold my game company, I'll probably turn around and invest in game startups. So that would be sort of the first little sort of set of rocks to, to, to look under. Let's imagine you found one, they're investing 50, a hundred, 200,000. So still relatively small amounts of money. Now you're hiring people, you know, you're, you're, you're making much more progress. Potentially you're starting to generate some revenue or, or you're, or you're gaining users or fans. 
Uh, and then you would go see the early stage VCs or what you call seed VCs. And they're usually putting in less than a million bucks, 250, 500, 750 million dollars. Uh, importantly, the friends and family, the angel investors, the seed VCs, they are all uh, pre-profitability investors, right? You have not yet kind of crossed over uh, to, to show that you can generate proven revenue or proven profitability. And so they are really banking on you, the vision, the pedigree of the team, you know, the, the sector you're in, the buzz you've been able to build. Uh, you know, they're, they're still investing in the promise of, of, of what the potential is uh, because you haven't yet sort of proven that you can generate sustainable profits. Um, and then once you cross that line, like let's say the game launches and it's starting to generate revenue and you're getting great reviews and things are going great and, and the business is growing, you know, then you go see normal VCs. They're, they're writing checks of a few million bucks. And then, you know, once you're really gangbusters, then you go to growth VCs and they're writing 10 million, 50 million, hundred million dollar check. But at that point, you've you're proven that you can be, whoops, you've proven that you can be profitable, uh, and they're just sort of accelerating or fueling that that growth. And so even though they're writing a hundred million dollar check, it's actually way less risky than the ten thousand dollar check that your uncle wrote you, you know, way way at the beginning. And so and so in that sense, um, equity funding is very layered, right? You're getting one small amount of money to make progress to then go seduce or secure the next chunk of money. With that chunk of money, you make more progress to get ready to go convince the next investor to invest. So it's kind of layered in this sense. And that layering is based on how you are progressing as a business. Uh, and not just in time, but it, like, are you actually growing the business? Are revenues coming in? Are users coming in? Is success occurring? And so, and so in, in this kind of, I mean, I don't want to say a weird way, but it, you know, you, you need to jumpstart things. And, and once you start progressing, then it's easier to kind of, you know, get wind in your sails to progress further and faster. But, you know, if, if, if you're, if you're just dead in the water, not moving, it is very unlikely that an investor will come in and say, here's the 5 million you need to, you know, to sail across the ocean. Um, so it's very, it's very incremental. It's very incremental. So on the terminology side, is that initial seed round, you know, after you've gone through the friends and family, I mean, assuming you go through all these steps and the friends and family and the angel, is that initial seed investment round what we hear of as the series A? No, no. So, so normally, normally, well, I mean, there, there's no sort of official textbook definition for these. You would normally have a kind of pre-seed so pre-seed would be, let's say, the money you and I put into the company of our own and maybe the, the money from my mom and your doctor buddy. That's like the pre-seed. Uh, then the seed round usually is the angels or an accelerator or incubator that are coming in with, you know, 50, 100, 250. Then the A round, then that's the normal VC. So normally it's pre-seed, seed, then it's A, B, et cetera. So you're serious. You're when we, when we see in the news and everything and we hear about people getting Series A, it's typically the first VCs to get in on the project. Potentially, potentially. So so uh, you do have early stage VCs or what you would call a seed VC yeah. that does come in earlier that potentially would invest at the seed round, smaller amounts. Uh, and then, and then, and then, then a Series A. Then it's the kind of the normal VCs. But, but you could do friends and family, angels at the seed, and then VCs at yeah. the A. I mean, there, there's no, there's, it's all, it's all kind of uh, blurry. It's like everything else in this industry. Yeah. yeah so yeah. we got a question, Jason. Can you talk about Tilting Point's funding model? Is it different? Yeah, yeah. So, so Tilting Point is is completely different <laughs> has, has nothing to do with what we've been talking about uh tilting point uh as far as i know they have essentially what is a a user acquisition fund uh and so they will uh provide cash flow and expertise 
to buy users for mobile games. So Tilting Point, uh, at least so far, is focused on mobile uh, and mobile free to play uh, specifically. And so if you're you know, a small developer, you've made a cool mobile game, free to play mobile game that has some good initial traction and, and there's some you know, you know, players are playing it, they're engaged, there's some good retention numbers. And then you're sitting there saying, listen, uh, if only I had, you know, a hundred thousand more users in this game, you know, we'd, we'd go from making X to be making X times a hundred, you know, because the, the retention numbers look good and so on. But, but you don't have a spare million bucks sitting in your bank account to go spend on Facebook ads and, you know, uh, um, uh, user acquisition, uh, uh, you know, ads and whatnot. Uh, so then you call up Tilting Point and you say, hey, let's let's partner on this. They'll look at the game to make sure that it makes sense in terms of the metrics. And in fact, the game is retaining users and they're converting and all that kind of normal uh, uh, mobile free to play lingo. And then if it checks out, they'll say, okay, good. You know, we'll, we'll deploy hundreds of thousands or million, whatever. Uh, and then you're doing a revenue share on, on, on that money, right? So they use it to do the ads, to acquire users. Those users then spend money within the game and generate revenue. And then you're splitting that revenue back to Tilting Point um, uh, and, and, you know, paying them. I, I don't know their exact revenue share terms, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing they'll recoup and then sort of take a share from, from there. So when you so, start looking for whether it be angels or VCs, how much does your physical location factor into this? Because we always hear that it's harder. I mean, I'm on the East Coast, so I hear a lot of the East Coast folks. Yeah. But I always hear that it's harder on the East Coast of the U.S. versus the West Coast of the U.S. And then that's before we even get into other countries. Yeah. How much does your location build into it? Yeah, in, in the early phases, uh, it's absolutely critical. And it's, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great point, Jay. Uh, the earlier you are, the closer physically, or geographically, and relationship-wise, the investor will be. Right. So at the very beginning, it's you. So I mean, it's like you can't get closer than yourself and your partners. Then the next round is friends and family, which you know potentially are living in the same house as you, or your mom's down the street, or you know it's your it's your friend from high school that lives you know across town. And, you know, it, it's phys it's close. Uh, angel investors generally, rule of thumb is they like to invest in the city they're in because they want to come to board meetings, they want to drop by the studio, they want to play the game, they want to you know hang out, they they, they want to, they want to be involved, uh, and and particularly for angel investors that are spending you know fifty grand, hundred grand, they do not want to do cross border investing because it's going to kill them in terms of legal fees and tax advice on, on, you know, ho holding equity in a company in Poland or like, it, like it just, you know, the, 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 the professional fees to close that deal will be like half the money I'll actually give you. And so it's, it's like economically doesn't make sense. Um, so, so friends and family, angel, even seed VCs tend to be hyper localized. And so you need to look, you know, in your backyard, down the street, in your city, maybe the town, you know, down the highway at, at most. Once you cross over into profitability and now you have a thriving business that's growing and you're looking for some extra fuel to, you know, grow the business, then you can sort of go to Boston, go to Silicon Valley, come up to New York, do a trip to London, visit, you know, a, a, you know because now they're going to be investing a million, two, five, ten million and spending, you know, a couple of bucks on lawyers and whatnot is inconsequential. Uh, and then once you're at the growth phases, I mean, then anywhere in the world is fine, right? Then you're you're getting deals from China, and you know, but these are, you know, you're 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 a massively profitable studio, you know, generating tens of millions, uh, you know. So in the beginning, you're literally, you know, looking in your own house down the street, you know, your neighbor your buddy from school, you know, this kind of stuff and the angels. So, so it's, it's actually a bit of a, a mistake that I often see is people are just getting started and they're, you know, they're in Europe or they're on the East coast and like, we're going to go fly to Silicon Valley because that's where all the money is. Those, yep. those big bags of money we heard of, we're going to go over there. 
and and almost every meeting will result in, hey Jay, your ninja thing is cool. Come back later when you're when you're further along and you've proven that you can be profitable, and then we'll look at it. Um, and so so I mean it's not a bad thing, but you're kind of wasting your time to go out to Silicon yeah. Valley. In because those- they're not close enough to actually do the due diligence to check in on you and follow up, and yeah, and exactly. two, they're not going to. And this is what I want to get into next. How do you? So, so we've talked about how you vet publishers, but you know, how do you vet investors? You know, what are they? I mean, aside, we know they're going to give us money. Yeah. What else is important? Because that's that factors into you know, this location thing as well, you know, they need to be close enough to be giving you some of this yeah. added insight or introductions or connections or, or what have you. So what should someone be looking for when they're going out and looking for investors? Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, m- m- money, of course, is part of it. Uh, and, and, you, and you're, you're, you're sort of uh, nailing it already, right? It's, it's, it's knowledge and expertise. Uh, and it's, and it's, uh, contacts and network right so so let's say you know we're going after an angel investor and and they just so happen that they were a game studio head that sold their company to google or zynga whoever uh microsoft and they're super successful and and they've got money to play with they want to help the local community they believe in you and your team you know they throw in some money but more importantly you know that that person has friends at Xbox and friends at PlayStation and they know the reps at Apple and Google and they have a buddy at Kickstarter and they know the guys at uh, Discord and, uh, you know, they're, and they're all on speed dial. It's like, oh, you don't know the anyone at Steam? Oh, let me talk to my, you know, account manager and, and you know, that, they'll hook you up and make sure you're in good shape. Oh, you don't, you didn't, you didn't talk to Sony yet? Okay, well, let me introduce you to the, to my rep at Sony. Like, so, so, you know, that is super valuable, just the connections. Um, and, and then, and then the knowledge, the knowledge, the expertise, you know, Hey, if I ran a successful studio and ship million selling games and, you know, maybe I have some wisdom that I can impart and, and help you to run your business, build your company, et cetera. Um, and, and certainly on the investor side, generally your expectation is that your current investors will help you land the next investors. Right. So if you take on some angels now, you're hoping that those angels have friends at the seed VCs. So when it comes time to do the next round, you're like, okay, don't worry about it. I've got some friends. We'll get you in the door uh, and accelerate that process. Because it's then, in their best interest too. Well, exactly. I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, they're not, I mean, they're doing it because they like you. They're nice people, but they gave you money now. So they want to ensure that the next person gives you more money so that securitizes their investment, uh, and, and so on. So, so ideally, uh, uh, your current investor has access to the next tier of investors and can help with that when the time comes. So, so it's it's kind of call it you know operational or 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 industry level expertise and knowledge. It's industry level connections and network. And then it's also, uh, you know, access to the next tier investors to to speed up that process when the time comes, uh, so that uh, you know you have, you have easier access to to, to investors. Um, and 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 listen, also, you don't want the investor to be some kind of jerk. Uh, you know, you you want them to be someone that you can kind of get along with. I mean, it, it, you know, an equity level investment is a form of marriage. I mean, they they are becoming a kind of co-owner in your company, right? They're buying shares, they're your partner, uh, and they're in this for the long haul. Uh, and, and if and if you hate their guts or they're just like a total jerk, I mean, that like, I mean, that's not cool. Like you don't want to be dealing with this total jerk for the next seven years or whatever. Um, so you do have to sort of just factor the human element of, hey, is this someone I, I can get along with and we can go sit down and have a beer and talk about business and you know, this kind of stuff. All right. So we don't want to keep you, keep you all day here because obviously we can keep this going, but we got a question in the chat and then I've got one more question I want to hit up as well. Uh, so Nightwolf says, would having a game already made, especially if, a, if it's a mobile game, allow you to get investors easier? 
though would seeking a publisher to stay with seeking a publisher to stay with be better or to go with investors and self-publish that's Basically, a deep question got a mobile game does it make it easier to get investors and then from that point or also at that point is it better to seek a publisher or to go for the investors yeah, yeah like this is like seven questions wrapped into one <laughs> um I, I mean having track record helps Right, so you're not just a bunch of kids at a school, bright-eyed with you know dreams and wishes with no experience, uh, and so and so the more you've done, uh, the more experience you have. You know, if you've got a ship game, you know that that definitely is sort of checking some of the boxes. Um, you know, if, if the game is just up on the store but really did nothing, like no sales, no real results. I mean, the value, the real value, is kind of questionable. Uh, then, then it's just, hey, you know, we're a young team. We made a game. We've gone through the process, but we haven't really had any kind of success. Um, so it's limited in value, but there's still value to say that, you know, you've, you've done it. Uh, obviously, the more successful it was, the more leverage it provides to to seek investors or, or other partners. Um, but, but you, you know, you, you have to kind of flip it and you have to think from this point forward, what is the opportunity that I have to pitch? And, and then we go back to the things we were talking about at the beginning, right? If I'm working on free to play games as a service, you know, building my funnel of users, and I have a vision and a roadmap that I think will lead to, you know, growth and scalability of the company that will attract equity investors, you know, then I go pitch those equity investors. And then part of the story is, hey, we have a team, we've shipped a game, we've done it before. You know, here's our plan going forward and why it's such a great opportunity and you need to invest. Um, you know, if that's not really the case or you're doing premium stuff, uh, you know, then, then you're going to want to look for, for uh, publishers. But as a side note, if you're doing premium on mobile, you should probably give up and, and, and think <laughs> strategy to begin with because there are no mobile premium publishers, uh, more or less. So yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a hard question to answer with any real precision because I don't know the full context and story. But um, you know, go go back. What is the actual opportunity? Um, am I am I on the scalable exponential game as a service path seeking equity investors, or am I on the the kind of premium product path when that makes more sense to go get publishers? Did we want to read this other question from uh, er, Emerchal? Okay. Uh, this is from, he says, hi, Jason and team. Javier from Emerchal here, which that's, ah. a VR, that's a VR company, right? Yeah, uh, they're out of Mexico. Oh, nice. Uh, there are new platforms for gaming like Facebook, Instant, Amazon Echo. What are new platforms for story-driven games? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, we 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 had a bit of a pre-discussion on Twitter about the future of story, story-driven games. Um, I, I mean, th there's some interesting stuff that's happening with voice-activated uh, games. If you look at yeah, Echo and Google Home and Alexa and you know these kind of uh, smart home devices where it's really just a voice. Never say uh, the a word out loud in a stream. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's everyone's. A okay. thing starts going off everywhere. No, I have headphones on, but I do it accidentally, and then everything in, in the whole house starts going off, saying, "We don't know what you're saying." So, so uh, I mean, we're even seeing that in like in cars with voice-activated uh, interfaces in cars, uh, and so we are seeing some um, sort of choose-your-own-adventure style games and things that are happening uh, in 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 those areas that I think are interesting in a different kind of way. I mean, how big of a market will that be? It's not really proven yet. Um, I think I think that the challenge with story-driven games, depending on how you define story, is that the nature of the industry today, it's very hard to succeed with stuff that is uh, linear, fixed content. Because everything is tweeted and replayed and streamed on Twitch and reviewed on YouTube that if I make a story game that essentially is like a two hour, I don't know, walking simulator, here's, you know, save the world, you know, beat the ninja, whatever. And, it, and it's just a linear fixed experience. Everyone will watch that being played by their favorite YouTuber or, or, or streamer. 
and then they're done. That there's no reason for them to consume that experience on their own. Uh, and so the very things that are kind of driving success and discoverability in the market today, social media, Twitch, you know, all these things are, are in fact poison for a linear fixed narrative game. Uh, and so then if you're making linear story based, you know, fixed content games, how do you overcome that the inertia around Twitch and social media and so on? I, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, and I think, I think it's, it's very difficult to sort of build momentum and community around something that's like a two or three hour story game. Uh, e e even if it is the most beautiful two hour story game, just the nature of the dynamics of discoverability are, are in fact working against you, you, you know, versus if you were doing a multiplayer game or a match based game or something that was like a physics puzzler, you know, like where a poly, like a poly bridge style game where you build the bridge and every time you build it because of physics, it's different. And so then when I watch Jay play and his bridge crumbles every time, I'm like, Jay, you're an idiot. I'm going to go buy the game and do it better and, you know, solve it. And so watching someone stream and failing at Polybridge inspires me to come up with my own solutions. And then I go buy the game. And so now you're leveraging the dynamics of discoverability and Twitch and social media and replays and so on uh, to, to have success with your game. But th those things, again, are kind of poisonous if you are a story, linear, uh, you know, fixed experience. So I, I don't know if you, but. Are, and this is my question. Are these Alexa games actually making money? Well, the, I, I don't know. Uh, my guess is they, some of them are, but I, I'm just not watching that space closely enough to really know who's doing well. Uh, I mean, I, I have heard of a few startups that have gotten investment for 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 exploring games down, down this path. So I, think, I think there's some interesting stuff there. It's a new UI. It's, a, it's kind of a new platform. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I I just haven't been watching it closely enough to to, to know. All right. Well, let me put it this way: Have you played any of them? Do you have an Alexa? I I, I don't. I don't. No, I don't I'm, either. So I, I, that's part of the reason I was curious. Yeah. Um, um, all right. So. We've got a couple other questions in here. I'm going to ask you the one other big one I had first. Okay. When all, you know, with all of your experience in this and the developers and the companies that you've looked at and you've worked with, where do you see the most common mistakes being made? Oh, man. We need, we need, we need another hour. <laughs> uh, Oh, okay. Do you, I mean, that's a very broad question. Do you want to provide a little more context? Like the, mistakes in pitching, mistakes in building a company, mistakes in like... Mistakes in pitching. Let's, let's take that angle. Okay. Oh, okay. We still need an hour, but uh, um, so, so, I mean, we, we've touched on a few of them already. Uh, the, the first, the first, first one really is you're pitching a problem instead of pitching an opportunity. And that's the biggest mistake, and almost every developer does it, is, that, is they're telling you the problems they have, and please give me some money so that these problems go away. Um, and, and, it's, and sometimes it's a subtle way, but essentially they're pitching a problem, as opposed to really believing that they, what they're working on is an actual opportunity for the investor, and to pitch it as such, as an opportunity. So that problem versus opportunity is like the biggest mistake across the board. Um, so that, that's the first one. Uh, another one, specifically in terms of like pitch mechanics, is um, that there's no ask. So importantly, whenever you're pitching, there should be a clear ask, meaning how much funding am I actually seeking? Uh, you know, what kind of knowledge or expertise do I need? Uh, you know, what's the profile of the investor that, that I, that I want to engage? You know, like, like oftentimes developers will just say, well, here's my ninja project. And these are the people I got on my team. And, and they like, and they stop talking. And it, I have no, well, do you want money? How much money do you, what, <laughs> what are you just telling me because you want to tell me like, like, like this is a pitch. So I'm assuming you want to get fun. Like, like you have to very clearly have a slide that says the ask, like here's what I'm pitching for. Um, and part of that is 
that means you have to have a number, right? It's not just give me a bag of money and I'll do what I can with it. It's, you know, I, I've built my budget. I, I know what my run rate is. I, I, you know, I need this many programmers and this many artists and I need this many months. And so I've done the scheduling and budgeting and to go from where I am today to a successful project, I need X, you know, doing the calculations on the X is part of, a, you know, building confidence with the investor. And this is true for publishers as well. Like, you know, if you're doing the project pitching for publishers, you know, having that number and being able to explain how you got to it uh, is, is critical. Um, and so, so a big mistake is most people don't put an ask uh, in, in, in their pitch. Um, so the, the, those would be two of the biggest ones. Uh, I mean, the other is if you are pitching an equity investor, you have to talk about the vision of the company, the long-term roadmap, and you have to be able to demonstrate that what you are doing has the potential to scale. And again, that goes back to this means you're probably working in free to play games as a service, live ops kind of games. Uh, and you have to demonstrate that the roadmap is something scalable. Because remember, an equity investor is buying shares in your company. They don't get a revenue share if the game makes money. They, they get they have shares in the company. And the only way they make money is if the value of the company grows, if the value of those shares grow. And at some point in the future, they sell those shares or Microsoft buys your studio and effectively buys out their shares. And so they are concerned about the long-term growth and value of those shares. Uh, and so they're thinking long-term. They're thinking roadmap. They're thinking vision. So, so if you're if you are constructing a pitch specifically for equity level or company level investors, you have to demonstrate that you have a vision and a roadmap that will get you to that kind of growth. And if you come in and say, well, hey, we want a million bucks for the company and we're working on VR story games, you know, for five bucks a pop for single player, uh, you know, like it's a total mismatch. There's no way, <laughs> there's no way that your single player VR story game is going to become the next Fortnite. Like it just is, is not physically possible for the game to scale uh, in that way. So, um, so that, so that, that, I mean, I, I guess that's the other major problem is uh, because you haven't thought about what the opportunity is, it's not clear to you whether you should be pitching equity or you should be pitching project financing. And so how you structure your pitch deck and the story you tell changes dramatically whether I'm going for one versus the other. And, and, and if I only think of it as a, I'm solving my money problem and I haven't thought about what the opportunity is, then I haven't decided properly which path I need to go on. And, and so that's another big mistake is that they'll come in pitching a VC, but essentially with a publisher project pitch deck, which is, which is a mismatch. I, I love the way all y'all out there get super engaged in our show as, you know, as we get to the end of it, it's just like now we've got questions coming in left and right. Oh, uh, so Chili Killer, I'm going to hit both of these at once. He said, are you seeing anyone who is, transcending that you know narrative issue of how do i have a successful game in the age of streamers and everything else with a narrative game and then the follow-up is a oh, wait all right so chill we actually already covered that that one chill kill probably right before you logged on about the location of the team um so let's start let's look at the game side of it and i'll answer the other one for you in chat chill killer but are you seeing any studios that are um, so, so the quick answer is, is no. If you think of story or narrative in a traditional linear way. And so, and so, I, I mean, it's less about the idea of story and having rich characters and a living, breathing world. Like it's not that people don't want stories. In fact, everything we do is stories, even, even in Counter-Strike, right? Counter-Strike, there's still the story of the match and, you know, us playing and the challenges we overcome. And I mean, stories are everywhere. So, so there's a caveat in terms of what do we actually mean by a story? And so my comments about the kind of death of story games is really specifically something that is linear 
like a linear story, right? You know, boy meets girl, uh, ninja kills boy, girl saves world. Like, you know, it's linear and fixed, meaning it's about two, three hours and I play it start to finish and there's no variability and I just sort of click, click, click or, you know, punch, punch, punch and I go from start to end. And when I play it, it's exactly the same experience. When Jay plays it, exactly the same experience. When Andy plays it, when you play it, is a linear, fixed experience story game. Those are the kinds of games specifically that are in a lot of trouble uh, uh, today uh, because of Twitch and streaming and social media and replays and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and because there is no variability, it means that if I watch Jay play it, then I have zero motivation to buy the game and play it myself because I'll see exactly what I already watched Jay do. So how do you overcome that? Well, it could be a, a dynamic story where uh, you have branching narrative. And so, you know, there's key decisions you make and depending on what I, if I decide to befriend the ninja versus kill the ninja, well, then it opens up these branches. And then, you know, so now when I watch Jay play, I'm like, oh, that idiot, he killed the ninja. I would have been the ninja's friend. Uh, you know, so you're creating uh, uh, this kind of uh, dynamic element. Uh, but creating branching narratives is, is not a, a simple thing to do and is quite tough from a production point of view. Um, you know, the idea of, of um, you know, different endings or, I mean, roguelikes sort of deal with this and that there's a story, you're a vampire, you're going in the dungeon, you can only get so far, you die, you come back, you restart. And so it's kind of a single player, there's a story element, but there's a progression aspect and, and you're sort of redoing it. Uh, and so then I am somewhat motivated to do it myself and try to get deeper and further and maybe upgrade my vampire in different ways or, or whatever. Um, there was a, a story, and I, I need to follow up on it, but um, um, David Gilbert is a very famous uh, story or sort of a narrative-oriented designer out of New York City. Uh, the studio name is Wadget I, W-A-D-G-E-T, Wadget yeah. I. Uh, and he famously worked on many of these kind of linear, fixed narrative games. And last year, there was a few articles about him sort of realizing the, the wall he was hitting and that he was trying to, his newest game, and unfortunately, I had to forget the name of the game, uh, he was going to try to tackle this problem by, by working on branching narrative and in some way um, incorporate Twitch viewers I, I don't remember, but I remember reading the headline like, you know, Twitch is forcing me to make a different kind of story game. And I've not gone back to see what the result was. But if you're particularly curious of this, go, go look up Wadget Eye and David Gilbert and some of the stuff that he's said uh, in the past year or so. Uh, and that that may, you know, be an indication of a, of a new approach. So I, I, think, I think the main thing is you just have to overcome the linear sort of non-variable nature uh, of, of, a, of a pure, you know, fixed story game. So that's probably, that's yeah. why I don't watch, when I was playing Breath of the Wild, that's why I refused to watch my son when he was uh -huh. watching YouTube on it. I'm like, I don't want to know, all right? Yeah. Watch something else. Yeah. All right, Jason, thank you so much because this awesome. has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I hope you'll stick around the Discord, if not like, you know, focused on it at least there because if, if folks have other questions that they want to come in and and ask you can find yeah. you, know, you can find jason there we'll be around there's a link that is in chat for our upcoming micro conference so if you are interested in saving some money and meeting publishers and and streamers and, and influencers and, and lots of companies that can help your indie game business check that out so just just to jump in, uh, yes. I mean, I, I often speak at conferences and write articles and do interviews and stuff. I mean, if you just Google my name or go to like the GDC vault uh, and punch in my name, you'll see some other lectures on, on entrepreneurship and uh, funding. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lecture I did last year at the Indie Game Summit called Funding What When? which does a very thorough job of the sources and timing and, and uh, um, and such for, for both the equity and the project funding. So if that's of interest, that'd be a good, a good lecture. And I, and I believe it's one of the free ones, so you don't have to pay to, to gain access to that one. And but. we have, if I don't have it on there, I will add it. 
but we have a curated list of lectures from lots of conferences on YouTube. Yeah. And that yeah, so that, yeah, funding what when uh, it was an indie game summit at GDC 2018. So yeah, so last year. I will double check this afternoon and make sure we have it in there. But there's the link right there, folks. If you need, if you want to watch a lot of lectures from from smart folks like Jason on the business side of it and marketing and and all of that, the business aspects of of doing this stuff, you can find it right there on that link on, on our YouTube page. Yeah, so redesign was done from uh, role play with friends. Did our redesign? Yes. I I think it looks sharp. It looks sharp. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Rockman. Thanks, guys, so much for having me. Thank right. you, Jason. Take Thank care. You.